Happy Friday, Bitcoiners. I am here with two legendary Bitcoin historians. Uh, really excited to be walking through uh, this kind of untold history in Bitcoin. Aaron and Pete Rizzo, you guys just dropped a really lengthy article on Bitcoin Magazine, and we just put out a tweet thread kind of detailing the battle of P2SH. Um, but before we get into it, let's quickly kind of just talk about, you know, your guys' history and when you started covering um, Bitcoin. Uh, so let's start with you, uh, Pete, because you're kind of newer to Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, what mm -hmm. What's your history in kind of Bitcoin journalism and chronicling what's happening in this space? Yeah, sure. Happy to jump in there. So, um, you know, uh, recently now on the Bitcoin Magazine team as an advisor, super happy to be helping out with Bitcoin 2021. Um, but yeah, I've been writing about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency at large since 2013. That's when I got involved with Coindesk, uh, eventually became the editor there, uh, helped scale that team up. And yeah, wrote a pretty good body of work, I think, back in the day, um, you know, uh, on, uh, you know, the industry as it evolved. So, um, yeah, this is definitely, you know, me and then, and Aaron, um, you know, taking a walk back and, and looking at some of the history that predated even us, um, to just figure out, uh, you know, where that fits into the project's history and, you know, help us contextualize and understand Bitcoin today. I think as I wrote in my tweet, st tweet storm, kind of introducing, uh, that I'm with Bitcoin magazine now as an advisor that, um, you know, I think it's just super important that we continue to try to understand Bitcoin, right? Like, even though I've been in this space for, you know, six or seven years at this point, I still learn new things about Bitcoin every day. Um, and I think, you know, that's something we should, I think, do a better job of, you know, teaching new people who are coming in. Like, you know, Bitcoin is kind of a lifelong commitment to learning about it. Um, and, you know, for me, that hasn't stopped. And I don't, I'm not sure it will. So, yeah, the learning curve never stops, right? And it's always really steep. Um, Aaron, why don't you jump in? Yeah, so out of rhythm. Um, been writing about Bitcoin since mid 2013, I think, maybe late 2013. Uh, yeah, did a couple of sort of deep dives on the development of Bitcoin and also um, prehistory of Bitcoin, Genesis files. And one article that comes to mind is, for example, the, the history of SegWit. I wrote this article where it's sort of see how SegWit evolves, evolved over the years and ultimately became adopted as a soft fork in Bitcoin. And yeah, I think, um, you know, even like Pete said, even before SegWit, even before we were evolved, there were soft forks uh, and the P2SH1 was particularly, was a big upgrade. It was maybe even the biggest upgrade in Bitcoin's history. I don't know, maybe SegWit is, duh, doesn't really matter. But we, um, it's interesting to see how these big changes to Bitcoin happened. And for us, I think for both Pete and I, this was one of these topics. We knew that there was controversy about it back in the days. We knew that there was almost sort of like a preamble, preface, foreshadowing of sort of the block size war where uh it, it became clear that there were different priorities and ideas and the development community sort of didn't always agree on everything and it was on my to-do list for a long time to write this history on the p2s8 soft fork and at some point pete mentioned to me that he was thinking about doing that as well and that's how we came with uh with the idea to collaborate on this one mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, it was like, uh, you know, an opportunity also to dive back into, um, you know, things that we had heard about and, you know, confirm some new details. So, Yeah, so um, j let's just lay the groundwork a little bit for this battle of P2SH. Um, I think one of the key things here is there's a lot of big time Bitcoin players, you know, back then and, and, and still now that were involved in this. Uh, Pete, do you kind of want to talk about some of the key players that are involved in this? And then maybe we can just jump right into, uh, you know, what actually went down. Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that's uh, interesting to look back at the history um, is that, you know, we don't really know a ton about uh, some of the people and events that helped shape Bitcoin, right? So I think uh, some cool things that this article provides is it sort of gives us kind of new insight into how that happened, right? Like how Bitcoin was shaped as a philosophy and technology. 
Um, and it gives us a lot of really good examples of how the views of early Bitcoin developers, uh, you know, changed over time, like both how they were then and how we think about Bitcoin today. And I think it gives like specific clarity into like the people that contributed to that. Um, so in this specific story, you know, P2SH, um, you know, and this was like something that I learned over time, kind of, kind of reading about it is that it's really the first time in the history of Bitcoin as a software where the development community is meaningfully large enough for people to disagree, right? And I think that was one of the things that was really kind of shocking to me is like, you know, we know that Satoshi left the project, right? That's like something we all kind of like in Bitcoin just kind of internalize. But, um, you know, that was a process that was real to people in real time who were actually running this project that, you know, at the time of this article, Bitcoin is a $20 million um, technology, right? The Bitcoins within the software system are worth that much. So, yeah, I think it's really interesting to to see that part of it where, you know, Satoshi did leave the project and the project then evolved without him. And P2SH, um, you know, looking back, contextualizing now, I think you can kind of say, like, this is the first time the development community, you know, really was was robust enough to disagree about something. And you really get a lot of interesting, like, real-time reactions to, like, what they disagreed about. I'm not sure if Aaron, yeah, if you have any it, It's not that. just... Yeah, it's not just that they were big enough, that the community was big enough to disagree, or it's also just the fact that Satoshi wasn't around anymore, which makes it interesting, because at that point, the people were still the people were still around, and in this case, I say particularly the technical community had to figure out, okay, how do we actually change the protocol if we want to change the protocol? How do we actually do that? There, when Satoshi was around, he sort of still had a natural authority in a way over the project. He could make changes, I think, at least much more easily because he was the founder and everyone sort of recognized that. When he's gone, then how do you continue to evolve the project? Is it the new lead developer that gets to decide this? And if so, you know, was Gavin and Reason even sort of officially in that position or or are it the miners or mm. users or how does this actually work? And this debate became much bigger and crystallized out a lot more later on during the block size debates, but it was already sort of at play in this earlier soft fork. And that's, for example, when soft forks, like the concept of having a miner and four soft fork that was basically invented in this context. That's when they came up with this idea that- Right. Yeah, that's what I think is super fascinating about it is, you know, this is the first, this is almost the first kind of pretty serious upgrade to Bitcoin that's, that's made by the community. And, um, you know, they, just like we're learning like about a lot of the stuff now that we take for granted, like Aaron just mentioned, like soft forks, hard forks, that distinction. Um, you can even get a pretty cool idea in the article where, um, you know, they're still kind of grappling at this time with this challenge of, you know, this network of like nodes and miners is expanding and there's all sorts of things that are happening in the real-time network that they, they don't quite understand so well. And people come to different uh, agreements about like what is happening, right? So I think what you alluded to in your questions was, you know, that this is like a story of people and we get to see kind of which people contributed to certain philosophies of Bitcoin. Um, you mentioned Gavin Andreessen, who, you know, is the successor to Satoshi in taking over the project as the maintainer. Um, a couple other characters that people might be familiar with in the story uh, would be Amir Takai or Amir Taki, who I think, you know, has a couple of really good moments. Uh, and Luke Deshir, who, um, you know, as well, I think what's interesting is people likely reading the story, and this was my reaction, um, are probably going to look back at their commentary on what happened and say, okay, like this is pretty consistent with what I think now um, or how I would have reacted knowing what I know now then. Um, and it's interesting to see that a lot of the drama in the story is about these figures being like marginalized or, um, you know, made to feel that their opinion is irrelevant or in some ways, um, you know, they're even asked to kind of leave the project. Um, for the views that they put forward. And I think that's, that's super interesting because it tells us a lot about, you know, again, this group that kind of succeeded after Satoshi, right? Satoshi leaves, we have these new developers, they come to new viewpoints about what's happening. And I think, you know, it, it, it invites us to kind of ask some questions about, um, you know, how these things changed over time and evolved and, and, and using people who I think you can now say, after we've done this research, like contributed some really unique thinking to Bitcoin. Yeah, I would add Greg Maxwell to that list for sure. He was very early and, on. And Thamos probably as well, yeah. Yeah, well, Greg Maxwell was very early to recognize that miners don't actually make the rules. And he explained that even back then in like 2011. And he has been very consistent about that. And I would say he's been right about that. Uh, even throughout the block size 
wars and and it became sort of now i think most people sort of recognize this and back then it was something new he was having to explain he found himself having to yeah. explain it i'd say that's a good point i think the essential like one of the interesting early dramas in bitcoin i think is really highlighted in the story is that you know originally under the satoshi design everyone running a client was supposed to be a meaningful participant in bitcoin as a node and miner like today we 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 know that these are kind of two positions within the network right like you run a node you have a copy of the blockchain and you support the centralization of bitcoin or you're a miner right you're running a large scale hardware operation in a data center probably somewhere um, and we we really kind of know these two things as separate things um, but here you can kind of see that this is a middle time where that's breaking in real time and people don't know how to react to like what's happening right so um, one of the interesting things with P2SH is that, you know, it's a, it's a really small change, like, you know, overall, like, right, uh, we're using this strange word P2SH, but really it's, you know, multi-sig addresses were a little longer. They're like twice as long as regular addresses. And this was an attempt to fix that. Um, but in an attempt to fix that small thing, um, what they really found is that if you were to do that, there's all these second and third or fourth tier ramifications throughout the network, right? Uh, if you're going to make that change, well, it's going to break what older clients uh, know potentially, right? They ended up figuring out how to, a way to get older clients to, um, you know, not fork off the network by doing it. But that, you know, they had to deal with this uh, fact of they wanted to change Bitcoin in a really, really small way. Uh, then they needed to roll it out to the network. The network needed to adapt to this. And really just that very small thing um, sets off this cascade of people who have different philosophies about ethically how that should be, or um, you know, even just like what's the safest option and the safest route. Um, so you, you really get like a good kind of snapshot of, of what the thinking was at the time. And I think as Aaron alluded to, some people do emerge as, you know, being thinkers of the time who, you know, we certainly went back and like looked at the raw IRC logs in a lot of cases, the raw Bitcoin talk uh, forums that I'd invite anybody to like look at the citations in this. There's like 40 different citations and you can really kind of trace the conversations wherever you want. And, you know, some of the quotes here, you know, these are really unique quotes that we're presenting, you know, that are kind of based on like a ton of research. And, and what we can figure out is that, you know, this is kind of the only person we're hearing say this at the time. So you're kind of left with the question of like, are these unique ideas or does everybody think this? And this is the only one voicing it. Um, and again, it sort of asks us to kind of participate a little bit in like, you know, how do we get this Bitcoin philosophy that we have today? Um, which I think, um, you know, uh, and I don't think that should really be challenging that philosophy, right? I think we should want to know more about it and, and how it came about. So let me just Yeah, well, in. One, one of the interesting things about studying the history is that I think a lot of things in Bitcoin's history and even today, in you know, compared to Bitcoin's future, will have sort of these ripple effects. So this P2SH soft fork is an, is an uh, example of that where in a way it was a small upgrade, but then, you know, Fast forward to the to the day, and almost everyone, well, at least, I don't know if the, I don't have the ex exact stats, but I think maybe half of all outputs are locked into uh, P2SH. I don't know. I'm just it could be lower. I'm not sure, but a lot. Like it's it it has this, it carries forward, and it um and all that's the technical part. But yeah, also maybe the philosophical uh, philosophical part. How do you do it? How do who has the authority or who? How do how do you actually change the protocol that sort of sets a precedent in a way? Mm. Um, it's it can be used later as an argument that something happened in the past, so therefore it can happen again or not. Or that's that, that's what I feel. These ripple effects, these, especially the earlier you go, when it was a smaller community, actually the decisions made they made as a small community had a big. Right. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd piggyback on. on that and say like you know the events of the story really take place. Uh, in late 2011 to early 2012, so sort of a six-month period. And there's some kind of interesting takeaways you get um, from looking at that and, and understanding P2SH in that context, right? It's the first modern soft fork, right, that you can consider was, like, activated by minor signaling, um, you know, which is something that is kind of today. Hmm? Yeah, so, well, so kind of, well, but also hey, kind of not. so That's... I want to jump in really quick. So <laughs> yeah, sure. l let's lay the groundwork a little bit here. So let's start from Satoshi leaving the project and kind of what happened here. Before we actually went live, Pete, you were saying that you learned a lot about 
like the turmoil that kind of like happened amongst the group of people that you know were dealing in bitcoin when satoshi left can you just talk about that moment and let's kick it off there and kind of try to tell this story yeah sure i think um so that's not really like really part of this story so much but it does kind of influence it so you'll see at the beginning you know you sort of have to explain who these new group of developers are and i wouldn't say there really was a turmoil of satoshi leaving like the more that i can actually study that time period it seems that you know, he slowly stepped back and it really was Gavin Andreessen, um, who I think, you know, maybe people who are older in the community, like myself and Aaron know him very well. And, but he's kind of sort of forgotten and contra controversial figure now, uh, you know, stay at home, dad guy, uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, um, who, you know, ends up being sort of the caretaker of Bitcoin as, as Satoshi is backing out of the project and he's taking on more, more responsibilities. And, you know, he's really the kind of the person who, when we think about the modern participatory development that we have today, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that he's kind of the person who's behind that. Um, and, and really the story starts with Gavin kind of taking the helm of that group, right? His, you know, you can kind of think about it as he's been at home, like, you know, doing this random internet project, the guy he was working with leaves, he's got to build this new team. Uh, the team is, is building over 2011, Bitcoin's hitting a dollar. Uh, everybody's mining with these like new cards. It's an exciting time. And, you know, he ends up getting this idea in his head that, you know, people are losing money, they're losing Bitcoins and that's bad. So what can we do about it? And, you know, they find in the Satoshi code. Um, yeah, by, by, to... by losing money, to be clear, Pete oh, means yeah. literal like thefts, hacks, these kinds of things where people wake up and their wallet is just uh, empty. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, people were losing money, like not from the protocol itself, but they were getting hacked by, you know, people who all of a sudden wanted Bitcoins, right? So, um, you know, they, they find this old kind of command in the code that uh, Satoshi had put in there uh, saying that, you know, here's a multi-sig wallet. You can actually make a wallet that's, uh, you know, sign where, you know, to send a transaction, you have to sign it with multiple keys, uh, but it wasn't standard, right? The, the protocol didn't recognize it. So they had to do some work to bring it about. So anyway, like, you know, Gavin had this vision of, you know, we want to roll out better technology for users. We want users to feel more safe and secure. And that sort of kind of sets the tone for the story, um, you know, with his vision that that, that that is where Bitcoin should proceed. Gotcha. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, I mean, let, let's talk about um, why that people had a problem with that. In particular, it sounds like this is kind of where Luke jumps into the story. Well, no, that's fast forwarding a bit. Uh, Gavin's first proposal turned out to be broken. That was OP Eval, right, Pete? OP Eval, yeah. Yeah, that, that turned out to be broken. Uh, but then, um, I don't know, I, skipping ahead a little bit or... Do you want to say something, Pete? Oh, well, I was just going to say that, uh, yeah, that's, you know, for people who are kind of looking at it from a path, like current perspective, I think one of the super interesting things is like, as soon as they figure out how to, you know, do multi-sig and they write this code called Abival, you know, it goes from like three months from like testing to being put in the code. And one of the things is that, you know, Russell O'Connor, uh, who went on to found Blockstream and, 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 you know, is active in the industry today, I believe, you know, uh, kind of comes in the last minute and is like, what are you doing? This code is going to break <laughs> Bitcoin if you put it in. Uh, as it's designed. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the interesting part is like this group is still like coming together at this time, right? It's hard to, it's hard to really say that, you know, now, now we have this really like well-oiled machine, like Bitcoin development community. There's lots of funding for Bitcoin development. There's a well-established meritocracy of like longtime contributors. You, you mean today? Yeah, today, today. Yeah. And like back then, all of that was absent, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you really had it where a few people were chipping in and helping. They thought this thing was good. It ended up being bad. They almost pushed it in the code. Um, so yeah, you do get kind of this like interesting snapshot of like what Bitcoin was like then. And it's very different than it is now, right? Um, yeah, so especially the speed. I mean, if you compare it to um, the, the Taproot trajectory, which is, you know, we're pushing two years, I think, since it was first proposed. And now we're still discussing how it's going to be activated. Like it's, and back then it was a couple of months for, yeah, and so it turned out to be broken. So yeah. Yeah. This story is like six months and it's two full proposals that go from like them being written to them almost being activated. And then eventually like they do activate one, which um, I think is super fascinating because um, you know, we don't behave that way anymore and nobody in Bitcoin expects that to happen, but like they didn't, they didn't really know any better. Right. You had to, 
you know, I think to, to come back to your initial question is like, you know, this is kind of a story that that is the group of developers in the wake of Satoshi, like figuring it out. Like there was no other decentralized digital monetary system that was out there for them to look at blueprints, right? They had to go through the bumps and scrapes of learning what they were doing. And in this case, uh, as Aaron said, you know, yeah, Gavin gets this idea. He wants more secure wallets. They figure out a way to, they, they can do it without uh, splitting the network. They're super excited. Uh, someone figures out that, that it was probably a bad idea and it might break the network and they have to go back to square one. Um, so yeah, I think like when you were saying like, um, you know, where Luke comes in, obviously a huge contributor to the story as well. Um, you know, I think Luke's an interesting figure in the story. Cause I, you know, I, I think from what, um, Aaron and I can have, you know, be able, been able to find out is that he, he really comes with some interesting philosophical disagreements. Right. And that comes at a time when it seems like he's thinking about things and concerns the network should have, um, when they just, they're not really on the radar of other people, uh, for what we can tell. Yeah, so so ultimately the idea was to so OP evil turned out to be broken, but the general idea was that uh, when you send coins in a transaction, you send them basically to a smart contract kind of sort of thing, where it is defined how the bitcoins can be spent after that. Now the general idea here was that instead of sending it to a smart contract, you send it to a hash of a smart contract, and then when you want to spend the coins, that's actually when you want to reveal the hash. So until it's being spent, you don't actually, the rest of the network doesn't actually know how the coins are being locked up. Now it has a couple of benefits to do it this way, uh, but uh, to do it as a soft fork. So this, this was around the time where they were discovering soft forks or modern soft forks. And they were figuring out that, you know, if, if a majority of hash power enforces the new rules, then you actually keep the network together because the upgraded nodes will think the, the network is valid, the blockchain is valid because the new rules are being enforced by the miners. Uh, well, by the, well, anyways, the new rules are being enforced and the non-upgraded nodes, they'll still follow the blockchain because they don't care about the new rules either way. So this is the type of stuff that we're figuring out. Now, however, the way Gavin and Reason or the way it was proposed to do this to make sure that the old nodes would still be part of the network was actually by interpreting the output in a sort of unconventional way, in a weird way that works, but it was not how, it was not really how the Bitcoin protocol was designed or was working up until that point. And Luke Dasher in particular really didn't like that unconventional way of interpreting these new transactions. He foresaw that that would, especially in the long term, could have weird consequences or he was just... I would say maybe he's a little bit of a purist, a purist, like he likes things the way they're supposed to be. And mm. this was not the way it was supposed to be. So he he became a big critic of this proposal. Um, and when Gavin at first wasn't really uh, agreeing with the, the criticism, he didn't think it was a big deal, it was fine either way. And most of the developers sort of felt that way. That's when Luke, brought his concerns sort of to the pop to the public he went to mm. bitcoin talk and he was starting he was he was starting um i don't know what do you want to call it pete a war i think it's like <laughs> consensus building right so there's this other like interesting uh part of the story which i think uh aaron is alluding to which is kind of like the second half of the story um which is that you know, once you have a preferred way, like say you're a developer within Bitcoin and you want to advocate for something, like how do you do it, right? So I think with um, with Gavin, the interesting part of the story is like, you know, he's the maintainer, right? So if he decides he wants to do something, well, he's the maintainer. That's how open source projects works usually, right? I think Bitcoin ultimately went another way in deciding that, you know, there was another process and this is really, you know, you can see the seed of this, right? And you can see why, you know, certain individuals fought for the process to be different, right? Right now we have it where, you know, anybody in the world can 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 propose things to Bitcoin and, you know, you have to convince everybody in the world then that you, that they should change because of what you think, right? And I think, um, you know, uh, as, as Aaron was saying, like Luke going to the public for the first time, right? That other developers like thought this was shocking. Like, why would you like involve the users like in this decision? Like, do they have a role in the decision? So, you know, I think like yeah, well, we, well, especially oh. because this particular decision, like to to um, come to the defense of the other developers, would say it was a very technical, nuanced trade-off. And I think the other developers felt like, you know, what? How's the public gonna 
tell the difference. It's it's such a small, minute detail that really only high level experts of the protocol will understand. And I think I sort of understand that too. But um, yeah, that became a dynamic where Luke wanted to bring it to the public, and then as basically one of the only, maybe the only, I guess the only developer that sort of took Luke's uh, side of the argument there was Amir Taki. Mm-hmm. Because Amir Taki had, had uh, created the Bitcoin improvement process and he had this, he, he felt very strongly that Bitcoin changes did need to involve the public. They did need to involve Bitcoin users. Not necessarily, in that case, not necessarily because he disagreed with that particular change, but more as a general concept and also with an eye on the future that if in the future the development process would become you know corrupted or something then that, then the, the users have this sort of empowerment they, they're involved with changes so therefore it can't be corrupted as easily yeah so i think like you know if they, if, if they originally are debating like what type of change they should make and then the next stage is they're debating like well how does it roll out to the network and like how does it preserve the security of everybody using bitcoin kind of the next meta stage that the argument hits, and this is where it kind of like keeps compounding, is that, well, if people disagree, then like who decides, right? So you end up kind of seeing with P2SH that there's an emergence of the developers as one camp, like the users as one camp, uh, and the miners as another camp. Um, and there's disagreement about like, what are the roles of each of those parties in this distributed network? Um, and I think the cool thing about this story and then history in general, and why I think like this work is kind of interesting is that, you know, you can look at the events and you can like see what people said and how people kind of advocated for things. And and I think you can, you know, and hopefully if the story is successful, you'll be able to draw like your own opinions about it, right? Which I think is something that's kind of like lacking when we look back at Bitcoin a little bit. Um, and certainly I felt the way that way with the story, like, you know, when we started it, right? P2SH was something that like Aaron and I had heard about it. We were told about it in a certain way. Uh, we were told certain things that, you know, like, this was kind of the start of the fork wars. And this is where, um, you know, if we could go back and do it again, like we'd probably use Luke's proposal. Like you get like little pieces of it, but in this telling of the story, like hopefully you'll actually be able to see what happened, right? This is like pretty much everything we can find on the internet about this has kind of been compiled in here. Um, and you can kind of like, you know, hopefully like figure out which of these kind of, you know, uh, people um, like most relate to your values, right? Uh, is it, more of a Gavin or an Amir or a, or a Luke. Um, and I think that um, hopefully new people will find that it makes some of this stuff more accessible, um, even though it's like very, you know, uh, in a classic Bitcoin sense, like it's very complex, right? Like the idea that like users should have a say in the protocol or that miners shouldn't be able to, you know, uh, decide something for the protocol uh, if the developers disagree. Um, these are very complex questions, but like, we still live with these questions in Bitcoin every day, right? Like this is so this sort of continues to define Bitcoin as a technology is that um, I think to be good stewards of Bitcoin, like we should be asking these kind of questions like whenever we're talking about it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think this is like a good place to talk about what did Luke and Amir actually do? Right, because they didn't just sit around and just talk. They 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 acted, and you know they tried to prevent P two S H. Yeah, well, to be clear, P two S H is, and we explained this in the article. It's more of a family of proposals, and in a way, it's just a concept of how to do things. But in in practice, when we say P two S H, we mean the specific proposal that was ultimately adopted. But um, yeah, Luke made an alternative P2SH proposal. Um, what's it called again, Pete? Yeah, what CHV. Do we refer to? Check oh yeah, CHV. Verify, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that it it that it did something similar. It just did it on a not in this unconventional way. Now, after that, when he proposed this, uh, Amir wrote a blog post explaining what the two proposals were explaining a difference. He wanted to get users involved. He wanted the community to understand what the choices were. And as one of the sort of controversial things, he presented it as a vote and to be specific as a minor vote. So a hash power vote. So miners could vote on which proposal they liked, which was sort of, there was some truth to it in a way, 
but not because you need a majority of hash power for a soft fork. But the way developers, or at least someone like Greg Maxwell, originally intended that was more as a practical thing that that's right. how you can do a soft fork safely. It was never meant to be like a political vote on preference for miners. That was never really the idea. So that's where that sort of debate started. Like, is this, do miners actually have a vote in this way or not? And if not, then who does? Is it developers or the stuff Pete was just explaining? But yeah, so that's that's sort of, in a way, I would say in practice, it sort of did turn into a little bit of a minor vote where miners were signaling their preference and people were, at least some were sort of, Except yeah, if there was a else. new, I was going to say, like, the other character in the story um, that, that we were able to identify and got developed is this one miner um, who I had never really heard of before. And I would actually say that, you know, if, if you're going to consider me and Aaron, <laughs> like, historians, then I would consider this guy, Tycho is his name, as, like, a pretty significant player uh, in developing some of Bitcoin's philosophies. So, um, you know, we were mentioning that, you know, the central debate then becomes, like, should miners, like, actually enforce this upgrade? And, like, should they decide if Luke and um, Gavin are disagreeing and you know gavin and luke go to tyco uh, who's one of the major miners at the time i think he controls like 30 percent of hash power and they're like hey like you should decide like which, which which one do you think like who's right and he's like i'm not doing that like why why would i ever do that like i'm a miner like i'm here to like process blocks like figure it out like i'm not gonna i'm not going to tie break like your personal disagreement and i think that's super cool because again and like then, um and then he was getting heat for that so there you see yeah. that there was this big disagreement on who actually got to decide that some people actually well, were getting mad at him for not wanting to decide. Yeah. And I think that's what's cool, right? So you get to look at this individual who like emerged in Bitcoin's history at like a specific time and like, you know, a couple of developers at the time, like asked him a question that was like pretty significant. Like, right. I imagine if he had said like, oh, I'm just, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll decide. Like I'll just adopt uh, like upgrade and like miners should do that like maybe we end up in with a living in a version of bitcoin history where that's more accepted right but he, he doesn't do that and to have the moral like understanding and like the intellectual like choice it just showed a lot of foresight on his part and i think you know that's something that i got from him as like a character or like in writing that person and again i don't know if it's a him or a her i don't know anything about the person but you know um miners back then like they seemed like they were really informed about bitcoin right like at the, almost to the extent the developers were and certainly this tycho uh, character is like a person who's a very meaningful participant in this debate um but again yeah he's somebody who you would look back now and you would go oh yeah like that that person understood bitcoin like as we know it now and like he made the right choice like the, the world sort of asked him it's like maybe do something stupid and um he responded by like just being a good steward of bitcoin um and i thought you know, uh, he was super cool. And, um, you know, the whole, the whole story, I do think though, it's, you know, one of the things that it really gets across that I've kind of struggled to impart to people, uh, you know, just writing about Bitcoin generally is that, you know, Bitcoin is very complex and like minor, like disagreements, like, and I mean, minor is like very small and not minor as in minors is like small disagreements. Like, uh, like Bitcoin is a very well thought out, like technology. It's a very well thought out philosophy. And, you know, this kind of traces back some of those decisions, like to some of the earliest times, right? Um, so there's a nice quote in the article that I think, you know, from the people who read early, uh, seem to like it, you know, uh, where Luke says, um, you know, uh, you know, if you want a monarchical currency, like you should just use the Fed's USD, right? Like, uh, and you can kind of like go back to these moments and see that like, oh, that's like pretty formative. Like he's like one of the only person, uh, people at the time who were talking about, Bitcoin as like an alternative to the dollar, but like, you know, contextualizing in that way. So um, I think that's super cool as well, right? You can, you can, you can see that Bitcoin is this, you know, huge system that we all participate in. And then, you know, it really is kind of, you know, if you impart an idea and that idea is strong, like that idea will live on. Like, even if it faces like extreme um, uh, pressure to, to change. Um, and I think the story does a good job of that, or at least I think so. So where do you guys want to take this? Do you kind of want to tell the details about like how P2SH eventually got activated or do we, uh, you know, how, what do you guys think? Yeah, leave that to the readers. There's there's something left for them in the article then. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the article we, we sort of... Spoiled, uh... We already spoiled that it was activated. That, that, that part <laughs> is spoiled. Well, I guess it's spoiled if they if they use Bitcoin. They should, should be sufficiently spoiled for them, I, I would guess. Um 
but yeah, the article kind of ends like, you know, it alludes to, um, you know, what this story, I think like within the history of Bitcoin, right? So just defining what P2SH like was in the history. Um, I do think there's enough evidence here to say like, this is the first major disagreement about how the Bitcoin software should be designed. Um, and it is in many ways sort of foreshadowing the later fork wars, which I think is a, a period in the Bitcoin history we're gonna increasingly want to understand. Um, I don't think we really know that much about it. Um, even myself and Aaron, who like people who probably know more than most people about it. Um, Wait, you know, which part are you referring to? See, like, hmm? Which part do we not know a lot about? I don't think like we understand that period to the level of like understanding the personal choices. And like, you mean before the, we got involved ourselves? Even in those parts, I would say that there's a lot of that period that's not very well understood. Do you disagree with that? Um. Well, I lived through the fork wars. I was there. I don't know. I feel like I was. I agree. Uh, yeah. Well, like, you know, the mine. I, I, I still most think of it. there's I like think. a tremendous like amount of think. that story with like the miners, right? Like, what did they think? Who did they think? Who was influential like amongst them? Like, who contributed to those decisions? I think. Yeah. There's probably a lot of behind the screen stuff that we wouldn't know yet. Well, I guess my point is that like, you know, stories over time, like, like Bitcoin is a culture and it's, and it's a, you know, it's a tech, it's a movement, right? I think Meltem Demers has been tweeting about tweeting this and I think it's, it's pretty accurate. Like Bitcoin is a movement, right? And stories within a movement or in a culture become important because they can be distorted to like event mean things that like maybe aren't so true, like over time. That's like the, one of the dangers of stories. But I, you know, I do think that, um, we can continue to learn from Bitcoin's past. And I think what you get from stories like this, hopefully, is that, um, you know, we don't really have so much accuracy of like, if you think about Bitcoin as like today, I think it's like, you know, it's a technical system and a philosophy that is like pretty well understood. Um, but we're, we're, we're still really a bit unclear on like who participated in that and like what events meaningfully contributed to that. I think we know this instinctively. Like you can think about the pervasive, like, you know, Bitcoin core is evil or Blockstream is evil type memes. And I think some of this stuff lives on because it's opaque, right? Like the past events of Bitcoin aren't, um, you know, explained as well as like they could have been and they're not, um, you know, so again, like hopefully like what I think you get from the story and like I, the thing that excites me about continuing like work in this direction is I think people should be able to see that, you know, there's nothing to hide in Bitcoin. I don't think we have anything to hide. I think our choices were mostly pretty good, but I think in, in uh, opening up Bitcoin to new users, especially people who are maybe more intellectually minded, um, I think we want to show the work of, no, like th these choices we made, they're a product of like extreme stress, like extreme thinking, like people around the world, like literally debating this until they like grown men are crying, right? Like that's, there's a different level of like something being intense, right? Like you care about basketball or you care about your country or golf, but like, you know, again, like me and Aaron have seen grown men cry like over Bitcoin, right? Like it's something that you can't, <laughs> you can't like as a human, um, you know, I, I could read a meme or a tweet, but like there, there's nothing that's going to show you that, right? Like there's that, that's what Bitcoin means to people, <laughs> um, you know? And uh, I don't know. I think like that's the kind of story that I want to tell because I think that, you know, you look at the other cryptocurrencies today, I don't even know how much they really disagree with Bitcoin. Like, I don't know how much they know about it to even really disagree with it. You know, I don't, I think in many ways, like Bitcoin's uh, past and it's like technical decisions are like so opaque that like I, I don't actually even know if like you could meaningfully continue in a different direction from bitcoin like if you like had were presented all the facts about like what actually occurred with like bitcoin's design just to close it out if you if you two could pick a handful of individuals one two three that you thought throughout this process understood or were on the level of our kind of like understanding of bitcoin now the common consensus of like bitcoin governance uh the value of bitcoin all that kind of stuff who would those yeah. individuals be that's super easy <laughs> do you want to go first aaron or should i let's go there uh well if i'm being honest i'm not a huge fan of these kinds of lists <laughs> mostly because you might leave people out mm. But I already mentioned Greg Maxwell, who was very early to recognize that the role of miners was limited and very consistent. And I think right about that. So I know, I'll, I'll just leave it. So now I'm definitely leaving. Now I'm leaving out even more people because I'm just naming one. 
but <laughs> I guess the other person I would add to that, if we're only going to name one is the, I think Thamos is like someone I'm really interested to like learn more about and kind of like explore like his contributions to Bitcoin. I think that, um, certainly going back in this piece, like the, the starkness with which some of like, like his quotes and Maxwell's quotes uh, stand out is that they understood Bitcoin on a le- like very, very similar to Lee to how we understand it today at a time when not many people understood it that way. So let's just take that kind of like in a box. Uh, there's only certain assumptions you can draw from that. So like if you take these two individuals and you say like, okay, well, they really understood it as we do today. Um, my assumption would be like that they had a really big role in contributing to that. And I think that that's what you can kind of draw from this article or I'd be curious, I'm curious to go back and look and like kind of confirm this for myself. But I, I, I really am kind of shocked by like some of their statements in that, especially Greg, I think he understood Bitcoin as we knew it, know it now so well as to almost be like, you know, because when he's confronted with this idea of like, okay, should we ask miners to like upgrade the, the network? He is like almost so over this idea of having thought about it that he's fine with it because it's convenient, even though he knows it's wrong. Like there's a really great quote from him about, you know, quote, they're no longer being a fucked up situation where, you know, mining is no longer decentralized. Um, so that's cool, right? Like, it's, um, it's interesting to see those kind of moments. Um, and then um, I guess I would give another shout out to Tycho, who I, who I still think, like, you know, um, made an awesome choice to so somebody I'd love to know more, more about. And uh, maybe there isn't, maybe there isn't any more to learn about him or her. But um, I think it's cool to see that, uh, you know, there are some unsung heroes like left in, in the Bitcoin history who maybe haven't gotten their, their attention. I will say I really liked reading Amir's motivation for writing that article, even though I understand why some considered it sort of unnecessary or maybe even controversial to do it at the time. And even though, yeah, the mining voting, maybe that wasn't really the right perspective to put it in, but his motivation for writing the article in the first place, that it's important for the community for regular users to actually understand the technical trade-offs that are being made and understand the protocol in that way. I, I mean, I very strongly agree with that. And that's sort of part of why I like writing the articles I write. I'm sort of doing the same thing sometimes where I feel like, no, people need to understand the trade-offs and it's, it can't just be developers who, who have enough expertise to understand it. It's better if more people understand it, even if they're not, yeah, I would, I would say also a- adding to that, like with Amir, like, uh, you know, Amir is still around, like Amir, uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Nardoism. Um, Amir is in some ways like among the more meaningfully critical people about Bitcoin currently. And I think um, to look back at the story and to know that he, you know, thought that clearly about Bitcoin in those specific ways, it like does give you kind of pause to be like, okay, like, you know, are we are we not listening to him as much anymore for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? I think you know, me and him have had some like fun debates about, about that. Um, but you know, um, yeah, I think that's cool, right? I think that um, you know, there's a little bit of a reliance on the Satoshi myth still, and I think the Satoshi myth kind of lives on to obscure some of the more human contributions to Bitcoin. And I think like Amir's human contribution to Bitcoin at this time seems to be his, you know, almost singular advocation that users should be involved. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I think you can, you can take, you can look at the article two ways, right? You can kind of say, is that important? Like, did this matter? Or if we remove this person from history, would things have been different? Um, and you get to ask yourself that question. I don't know. I don't think there is a, I think me and Aaron have differed on this on a number of like specific instances. Like, I don't think there's a right answer. Um, but I don't know, like history is, you know, it's kind of, uh, this is how history happens over time, right? If Archduke Ferdinand, like, doesn't get assassinated, and like, you know, there's no World War One, right? Like, there's, you know, uh, history comes down to like specific people in moments yeah. sometimes, and maybe Bitcoin does also, like, even though uh, it's likely that we're going to live in time periods in the future where Bitcoin is so large that like none of us can really change it or have a meaningful impact on it, maybe. Yeah, I guess the, the uh, well, uh, well, hey. You asked for free names, so I might as well name a third one by now okay. then. So it's interesting to see that Luke, his alternative proposal, he wasn't, um, the, I think the main problem, and this is also sort of shown in the articles, that the way he was advocating for the alternative was not very popular. But in retrospect, 
I think most developers, or at least the ones I spoke about it, spoke with, uh, that I spoke about them. Wait, that I spoke with about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you can pick one of those. <laughs> um, I th in retrospect, I think most sort of agree that actually his proposal was a bit better. It, it, looking back, maybe that was actually the way to go. So that's that's sort of interesting. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And I think that's like the cool thing about hindsight, right? Is like uh, people, our opinions about things in the past like change over time, right? And I think, um, you know, we, uh, you know, in that case, like, you know, history did unfold a certain way and then the past to like the, the future corrected it. Right. Like Luke was uh, like, if you think, so I guess you have to ask yourself if you think there's like an abstract, perfect Bitcoin philosophy. Right. And like, did like in the future, like a mistake was made and then it was adjusted. Right. Like now we, we can consider this as being like the preferred proposal. It's not what actually ended up in Bitcoin um, for a lot of reasons. Like the development um, cycle wasn't as mature. It wasn't as robust and the thinking around it wasn't as robust. So, you know, I, again, I think like this kind of stuff for me, um, you know, often recently, I think I've like, you know, these stories that you kind of hear in Bitcoin, I, I think we have to keep some of them around um, because I think they are helpful to, yes, um, you know, like new people, like even the yes. idea and like, we haven't talked a lot about him is like Gavin and recent in the story, like Gavin is like a largely forgotten figure and, a, and I would say a pretty maligned figure. But even in the story, there's a lot, I think, where I've think that Gavin was pretty reasonable, right? Like there's a lot mm -hmm. of like things that he contributed to the project and I thought it was cool one moment like that I'll share is like where you get to see Greg Maxwell and Peter Woolley react to Gavin's proposal of like how to do the soft work. And like Greg Maxwell is like, wow, like that's, I didn't even think that you could make an update to Bitcoin without, you know, creating a fork. But, you know, he's just so uh, like odd by that, right? Like there was possible for, for even someone like that to contribute, right? Like someone who today we might not think of him like so highly, but, um, you know, he did also give like great contr contributions to Bitcoin and we have to live with the fact that, you know, maybe he's not as much of a villain, like where he's a more kind of complex character, right? These are really mm -hmm. complex people. Um, and we don't need heroes and villains, but we should understand <laughs> what people, people did, are not good with they... nuance, Pete, people are not good with nuance. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, we're, I think yeah. we're getting close to, to the time. So I think there's a good spot for both, um, you know, plugs for what you guys are doing now and where people can find you as well as I think a moment for, for last word. So, um, Pete, let's go right back to you. Um, here's your last word, man. You just want me to pick like one word or, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no, I like, uh, you know, super excited to like be helping out Bitcoin magazine. Uh, it was awesome to write this article with Aaron, you know, we have been in a lot of the same places and a lot of the, you know, written a lot of the same articles over the years. So it was cool to collaborate, collaborate and, yeah, for myself, you know, I left uh, journalism and my full-time capacity last year, um, and I was really kind of disenfranchised with the process. Like, I didn't know if I was really contributing, you know, anything to Bitcoin, um, and I, I really kind of had to take a long look at that, and um, I guess I would hope that people think that this contributes, right, and that this direction of this work um, could contribute more in the future. So I'm excited about that. I'd be excited to talk to people about it, right? There's a lot of people, I think, who have perspectives on the things that happen in Bitcoin. And I think uh, before we all, you know, perish uh, and leave, you know, leave, leave the world behind, we should probably leave, leave these behind for, for people to figure out what we did. So love that. I'll, I'll end with that, like, reminder of everyone's mortality. That's like really depressing. <laughs> no, but I, I love that, though. And, uh, and Aaron, let's, let's jump over to you. I know you, you are doing a lot to, you know, illuminate all of this kind of stuff. So potentially the most out of someone specifically for Bitcoin. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it was cool to write something with uh, Pete. We've known each other for years. Uh, never never collaborated in this way. So that was fun. Also discussing Bitcoin and Bitcoin's history. Um, people can find me. That was the other thing you wanted me to mention, right? So people can find me on Bitcoin Magazine. That's where my articles are still posted. Twitter, at Aaron Van W. Uh, I have a podcast with Shosh Provost, which is the Van William Shoshnado, which you can find in your podcast app. I have a Dutch podcast, if you speak Dutch, which is The Bitcoin Show. I think that's about it. All right. I think that is a wrap, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, check out the article. Seriously, it's, it's a really amazing to learn about this history and 
Uh, I think Pete and Aaron both did a fantastic job on this stream and on this podcast to, um, you know, go into the nuances behind the actual story. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to go into the commercial. <music> Thank you.